Coming up in this video, I'll take a look at the article in the i newspaper that seems to be riling everyone up on Twitter. Why does it matter? Hi everyone, I'm Martin Bamford, a Chartered Financial Planner at Inform Choice, and in this video I want to take a look at an article that's been published in iNewspaper. It's been written by the brilliant Elizabeth Anderson, and it's about this 22-year-old media professional. She is called Afroza Masinwala. She's a media professional living in Manchester, living at home rent-free with her parents and saving to buy a house. And time and time again, we see articles like this. We see money makeover type features where the punchline is, I'm saving loads of money, but it's because I'm living rent-free with my parents. And every single time, without fail, it seems to get the world of Twitter and the rest of social media really angry, really riled up about the details. So I want to look at, firstly, some of the Twitter responses to this particular article, and then go through the article with you, pull out some learning points, some highlights from that article, and also talk about some of the implications of young adults moving back in with parents, living rent-free whilst they're trying to get onto the property ladder. So first of all, I want to take a look at some of the Twitter responses. So these are responses to Elizabeth Anderson's tweet. She's at Lizzie Anderson UK. And some of my favourite ones as I go down here. Um, ha 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 ha, can we change the title of the article to, as a 22 year old, I have to live with my parents, so I cannot budget myself as my outgoings are over 200 pounds and I have no essential bills outside of my phone. And then somebody else has said her parents aren't doing her any favours. When I was living at home, at least half my salary went to my parents for rent, bills, etc. And the rest was for my day to day expenses and savings. I learned how to budget. Yeah, I don't think your parents like you particularly either. Um, someone else there, how I manage my money in two simple steps. One, have money. Two, have no financial responsibilities. Simple, if you can do it, anyone can. I think that's a, a flavor of some of the Twitter responses we've seen to this particular article. People are riled up, people are angry. And when you go and read the article itself and read the details and understand the details, I don't personally think there's any reason to be upset by this. So I'm gonna go into the article itself here and just work my way down through some of the key details and just give you some commentary on those. So this is about a 22 year old media professional living in Manchester with her parents while she saves to buy a home. And you work your way down here and it's got this fantastic box of the regular outgoings and salary details. They've helpfully calculated that this salary of 22,000 pounds a year, once income tax and national insurance has been deducted, once the compulsory pension contribution has been deducted, that leaves this lady with 1,452 pounds a month after tax. So that's her income, her net income. And then the regular monthly outgoings. So rent and mortgage, zero, she's living rent free with her parents. Council tax, zero, utilities, zero, uh, zero, zero, zero. There's other zeros in here too. For example, transport costs, she's working from home as many people are who are office workers right now during the pandemic. Because you're working from home, that means no transport costs for getting into the city, no commuting costs. Holidays, zero pounds again. Well, duh, we're in a global pandemic. Of course, you're not spending money on holidays. So lots of zeros in areas where most people would expect to see some type of expenditure. There's small amounts going out and other things. So £20 on the broadband and landline, uh, £20 on the mobile phone. It explains later, I think, in the article that she bought herself a mobile phone handset for cash a bit of an impulse buy, which is something I'll come on to in just a moment. And for that reason, she has a SIM only plan. So £20 a month is pretty cheap for a mobile phone contract. Uh, £20 a month on groceries, but that's snacks, favourite snacks and oat milk. Um, and then some pet related costs because she has a one year old bicolour cat called Mizo, fantastic name. Uh, pet insurance, five pounds a month and pet food, 10 pounds a month. You know, at 22 years old to be sensible enough to get pet insurance, I think says, speaks volumes really about the attitudes this young lady has towards money. That's a good insurance cost, you know, five pounds a month. If your cat gets hit by a car, God forbid, then 
it covers the expensive vet bills and you're not then losing all that money. So that's a really good spend. Um, Spotify, £10 a month. You know, who of us hasn't got a Spotify account at £10 a month? Um, and then some sort of occasional spending. The one that worries me in here slightly, £50 a month on beauty costs, uh, mostly skincare products. That seems like a lot. Um, gifts, nothing regular, but I recently spent £96 on my best friend's birthday. Um, and and £96 you know, as a share of £1,452 a month is quite a big spend. £72 a month on driving lessons. And I think that's a really positive spend too. Something that's going to give you real freedom and independence in the future. And driving is a, a life skill that everyone should have. And then savings, £900 a month. So looking through those outgoings, nothing extraordinary in there other than the fact, of course, that she's not paying money on rent or mortgages because she's living rent-free, housekeeping-free with her parents at home. So let's look through some of the comments in this article. And firstly, she points out that she is aware how lucky she is to have barely any financial responsibilities for two main reasons. Firstly, living at home rent-free with the parents. And secondly, because she's not commuting. But she says she, she realises how lucky she is to still have a job during the pandemic. And I think possibly that's what causes some of the nastiness, some of the backbiting on Twitter, which is people across the country, across the world, are right now in quite a tricky, precarious financial position in many cases. They're uncertain about the future. There's been a sharp uprise in job losses so people don't feel confident about their long-term job prospects in the current pandemic-led recession. So she recognises this, she recognises she's lucky. Um, it goes on to explain that this lady is a hard worker, she is a grafter. She didn't go to university and to be 22 years old as a non-graduate earning £22,000 a year is pretty good going. But it explains in this article that's really because she's a hard worker. She um, was paid a minimum apprenticeship wage to get into break into this uh, PR type industry and then for two years saved all the money from her apprenticeship and then spent her annual leave doing internships in London, probably unpaid internships, at big magazines, Cosmopolitan and Harper's Bazaar, using the savings for rent and travel. And what a fantastic way to do it. You know, there is an alternative to spending X thousand pounds a year, seven thousand pounds a year on university fees. And that is to work straight out of school or college, to save money, to work hard, save money, and then to gain valuable career experience. And then hopefully overtake what you would have earned as a graduate because you've had that real life work experience. So I think that's really positive. It shows what a hard worker is, as, as does something else a little later in the article. And it explains the circumstances of why she is now living at home with her parents in Manchester. And that's because she was unemployed for a while when she finished up these internships in London. So she moved back home with her parents. I don't think there's anything unusual there. She then got herself a job locally in Manchester in the city. So he explains what her job is and how much she loves it. Um, this is a bit of a red flag here and something to watch out for. She does say that she has learned she's quite an emotional spender. She loves to treat herself often. Now, emotional spending, spending money in response to negative emotions, to cheer yourself up, to make yourself feel a bit happier because things are going bad. That isn't a bad thing in itself as long as you have it under control and as long as it doesn't spiral out of control in the future. Um, we've come across lots and lots of people who are self-confessed emotional spenders. And whilst that can start off small, it can quickly snowball. And as soon as you start getting debt involved, credit cards, store cards, personal loans, etc., um, and you're spending more than you can afford to spend to salve yourself with this emotional spending, that's when it becomes really problematic and something that can be very damaging to your long-term financial health. So keep a check on that one. If you recognise already you're an emotional spender and that you'll treat yourself, you know, talking here about £50 on one skincare serum. I, I personally can't imagine something costing that much for some moisturiser, which is effectively what this is. You're paying 50 quid because it's nice packaging, it's branding, it's being sold to you by the advertisers, not because it's worth 50 pounds what's in that product, regardless of what you might believe. So go back to basics here. I bet you can get the same active ingredient, the same serum, 
not for 50 quid, but for five quid, if you look around for it and actually sacrifice the brand, sacrifice the packaging. Um, there's some really interesting commentary on here on the cultural aspects of her spending and saving attitudes. She's explaining in Asian cultures, renting isn't common. Many of us live at home until we get married or buy our own place. And of course, everyone on Twitter has been so judgmental about this decision for her to live at home rent-free with her parents until she can afford her own place. But this is the norm in many cultures in many religions and I think it's wrong for us to try and impose our own worldview, our own cultural view on other cultures when it comes to financial decisions. Um, this is the bit I love about the article, one of the bits I love about the article. This lady is a hustler. She has started a side hustle, a side business. She buys 90s style shoulder bags wholesale and then sells them on for a profit. Fantastic. And this is exactly the attitude you want. If you're trying to save to buy a property as a young person, you're trying to cut your expenditure as much as possible and boost your income. And if you reach a limit, if you reach a ceiling when it comes to your employed income, the next step is to consider how to create a second income or a third income. So buying shoulder bags wholesale, selling them retail effectively, selling them via social media, brilliant. She buys the bags for five to 10 pounds. She sells them for 20 to 30 pounds. So a three to four times profit, uh, multiple profit on the cost of buying these bags. Wonderful. And she wants to invest that money that she's making selling the handbags on a proper website, on some branding, some packaging, and then wants to have two regular income streams by the end of the year, one from home and one from work. Wonderful. Love it. Absolutely love it. And it's the right attitude. If you are working hard to get on the property ladder, which we know is a big challenge, which we know for many younger people these days feels like it's always out of reach because property prices are rising that much more quickly than your ability to save money to get onto a property ladder to save your deposit, then bring in an additional stream of income. There are no barriers to doing this anymore. You know, the internet makes it very, very straightforward to start a side hustle. And even though these are reasonably small amounts, you know, 20 or 30 pounds profit each time, that adds up quickly and you start doing it at volume over time. And that really does make a big, significant contribution to your savings objectives. So brilliant, fantastic. Um, she's also saving to buy a car. She set a budget of £5,000. Bit of a delay, as many people are facing right now, on actually taking a driving test because test centres are so limited in terms of the number of test slots. So that won't happen for a while. But she's saving £5,000 for a car. Fantastic. And saying that she's likely to be working from home until at least the end of the year. So that saves money, 50, 60, 70 pounds a month on transport to work. So again, all this money, and this is common through the pandemic as well, where we're being forced to work from home, where it's harder to spend money on eating out, going on holiday, etc. This is money we should all be saving. This is money we should be putting towards other future financial objectives. That might mean you take that spare saving and you put it towards paying down expensive debt, or you clear a bit of your mortgage, or you boost your cash emergency fund. But don't let this pandemic slip you by and all of a sudden next year find you back in work, back into the normal rhythm of going out with friends every week, going on holiday once or twice a year, spending all that money that currently isn't being spent, and think, where did that money go? It's got frittered away over time. So have a clear purpose for that money you're saving as a result of this pandemic. She goes on to talk about impulse buying again, that the mobile phone handset was an impulse buy, but it has at least saved her money on the monthly SIM only contract. And talking about the fact she has an impulse buy, she's trying to stop it. A bad habit of impulse buying and allowing her emotions to impact the spending. I've touched on this already. It's fine if you keep it under, under control, if you've got a good check on it, if it becomes problematic, if it leads you down the path of debt, then that really is a problem. And then talking about charitable giving as part of her culture, part of her religion. During Ramadan each year, it's obligatory to give 2.5% of your wealth to the poor, but people often give more. So she donated £250 to her local mosque, and the mosque then distributed that money between different local charities. Fantastic. Um, and again, I wonder if some of the backlash on Twitter is people, I guess, imposing their own shortcomings, their own deficiencies on someone who is doing good in the world, who is giving money to charity. 
And if that sort of calls you out because you look at your own expenditure and you think, well, I didn't give £250 to a local charity last year, but I sort of wasted it on clothes or magazines or you know, anything else that you frittered that money away on, uh, that might sort of flag up some um, deficiencies in your own spending attitudes, your own saving attitudes. And I wonder if that's where some of this backlash on social media has come from. Um, and she's currently putting aside £900 a month into a regular savings account, hoping by next year to have passed the driving test, launched her own business, and the house will hopefully follow a couple of years later. My closing comment on this article is that last line, the house will hopefully follow a few years later. Any financial goal you have in life, I want you to make it smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. Apply those factors to any financial goal you've got. It's too vague to say hope the house will hopefully follow a couple of years later. In my experience, it won't. It won't just happen unless you make it really clear. You put a time scale on it, you put specific amounts on it. I don't know how much a one bedroom apartment, one bedroom flat in Manchester costs, or in the suburbs perhaps, a small house, uh, and what that means in terms of the deposit she's going to need to buy that to get onto the property ladder, but it's the time to look now. So you set yourself a really clear savings goal, and you set yourself a time scale to get there as well. And then you can monitor your progress towards it. You can stay motivated as you see yourself taking small baby steps towards that bigger target. Now, the whole issue of living rent-free with parents is obviously a bit of an emotional one. I think when people see that, they feel this is a sport brat, they feel this is somebody that's got yeah, everything handed to them on a plate. The reality here is there's a balance to be found. And there was some interesting research out today, which I can open on my page here. Um, it found that over a third of people set to retire in 2020 are still financially supporting family members. So this is new research from Key who are an equity release specialist, they found that 34% of people planning to retire this year support their families with regular handouts, adding up to over £3,700 a year. So that research is important because of this balance, I think, that adult, young adults and their parents need to strike. On the one hand, if living rent-free at home with your parents allows you to get onto the property ladder that much quicker, it allows you to accelerate your home purchase, that is a price worth paying. And I'm sure your parents would see that as a worthwhile investment in your long-term future. But the balance is on the other side of it, because if as a result of you living at home rent-free, not paying any housekeeping, sponging off your parents, if as a result of that action, you are going to give them an impoverished retirement or you're going to delay their retirement by a number of years, that's a negative outcome and that's something I think needs to be spoken about, needs to be addressed. So the answer, as you'd expect me to say as a financial planner, the answer here is financial planning. The answer here is to have clear financial goals and multi-generational financial planning too. So if your finances are intertwined between you and your parents, your parents and the adult children, as they are in this case, in the case of the article, then that is a really good prompt to view your financial planning more holistically. Doesn't mean you have to share the ins and outs of your finances, but you should at least have a conversation about about money, about expectations, about the fact that you're allowing your child to live rent-free in your home and why you're doing that, the purpose of that exercise, that you're trying to give them an accelerated leg up onto the property ladder. Now, coming up next week, it is Talk Money Week. Talk Money Week is a national awareness campaign designed to get us talking about money. And I think this is what it all comes down to. It's great to see on Twitter, on social media, the conversation about this article, about this case study, even with the negative and the snarky comments that come with it. Some of them obviously very, very riled up, as I said at the start, about this situation. But there's positive stuff in here too. And I think disclosing people's typical spending and savings habits, their own financial situations, through articles like this, through features like this in the newspaper, is healthy. If it gets us talking about money, if it gets us talking about the right balance between spending on essentials and on stuff we want and then on saving and investing for the future, that's really good. Money has been a taboo subject for too long and it's healthy to talk about money. It's very unhealthy to not have these conversations, particularly within families, but also in broader society too, as this newspaper article is doing. 
Let me know what you think about this 22-year-old PR professional who lives at home with her parents in Manchester rent-free. Has this made you angry or do you get it? Do you think this is a sensible approach to getting onto the property ladder that much faster? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this video and for supporting this channel. Please do press the subscribe button. We are on our way to a thousand subscribers now, which is really exciting. Until next time, I'm Martin Bamford and remember when it comes to your money, the more you know, the faster it can grow.